Welcome to module 5 of chapter 2. In this module, we will discuss two important results of number theory. One is Wilson's theorem, other is Chinese remainder theorem. Before proving Chinese remainder theorem, we will introduce linear congruence. In this module, the learning objectives are, we will discuss Wilson's theorem, we will state and prove Wilson's theorem, linear congruence equations and we will state and prove Chinese remainder theorem. Wilson's theorem, if p is a prime, then p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod p. Statement is very simple, what it says is, if p is a prime number, then p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod p. So, the we will prove this one. It is easy to see that the result is true for when an, when p is equal to 2 or p is equal to 3. When p is equal to 2, that is uh, 2 minus 1 factorial, that is 1 factorial, that is 1, 1 is congruent to 2 minus 1 mod 2. When p equal to 3, that is 3 minus 1 factorial, that is 2 factorial, that is equal to 2, 2 is congruent to minus 1 mod 3, that is also true. So, these two cases are easy to check. Now, we will assume that p is a prime and p is greater than 3. So, let us assume a belongs to 1, 2, 3 and so on p minus 1. Then we look at this equation, actually it is called uh, congruence equation, a x is congruent to 1 mod p. So, here we are looking all x such that a x is congruent to 1 mod p. And uh, this a x equal to 1 mod p has a unique solution. It is because a is belongs to 1, 2, 3 and so on p minus 1. So, the unique solution is, let us take x, x is equal to a dash, which is also belongs to 1, 2, 3 and so on p minus 1. Having a solution here means that a x equal to 1 will be satisfied under modulo p, that means p divides a x minus 1 and that x is also is one of the element number from 1, 2, 3 and so on p minus 1. Further, it is easy to verify that a dash equal to a holds only when a equal to 1 or a equal to p minus 1. So, it is better to prove this, this part. Thus, the p minus 3 elements in the set 2, 3 and so on p minus 2 can be paired into a a dash. Here, a, a is not equal to a dash. a equal to a dash will hope will be possible only when a equal to 1 or p minus 1. So, we have p minus 3 elements. So, since p is odd prime, so p minus 3 is even. So, we can, it is easy to pair these elements. So, hence we have p minus 3 by 2 pairs. So, we, if we multiply all these, we will get p minus 3 by 2 pairs of equations or congruences. So, that is 2 into 3 into 4 and so on p minus 3 into p minus 2 is congruent to 1 mod p or equivalently p minus 2 factorial is congruent to 1 mod p. Now, multiply above equation both sides with p minus 1 to get p minus 1 factorial is congruent to p minus 1 which is congruent to minus 1 mod p. It is easy to see that p minus 1 is same as minus 1 under modulo p. It is because p minus 1 plus 1 is divisible by p. So, p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod p. So, this proves the result, but here one of the important thing is that we have to establish that we request reader to check those things carefully that one is a x is congruent to 1 mod p has a unique solution. Other case is that this a is equal to a dash will happen only when a equal to 1 or a equal to p minus 1. Now, we will look for alternative proof for this Wilson's theorem. So, in this proof, there is no need to look for those things. We have, we have to show that in the previous proof, what we have is a x equal to 1 mod p has need to show that it has unique solution as well as a equal to a dash is possible only if a equal to 1 or a equal to p minus 1. So, but here by Fermat's little theorem, every element in the set 1, 2, 3 and so on p minus 1 satisfies x power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. It is because 
the GCD of 1 comma p or 2 comma p and so on p minus 1 comma p is 1, that is why we have this part. So, in other words x power p minus 1 minus 1 is congruent to x minus 1 into x minus 2 and so on x minus p minus 1 modulo p. So, if you substitute x equal to 0 in above equation and the fact that p is an odd prime will help us to get the required result. So, this is an alternative proof and very simple proof, but here we are using Fermat's little theorem. Now, we will look for the converse of the Wilson's theorem. Interesting thing is the converse is also true. So, how to show the converse of Wilson's theorem? That is, if n minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod n, then n is prime. That is, what we have to show is n minus 1 factorial congruent to minus 1 mod n, then we have to show n is prime in this case. So, suppose that n is not a prime, that means we are proving a contradiction then n has a divisor d which is strictly licensed between 1 and n, since every composite number has a factor which is licensed between 1 and itself. As 1 is less than d is less than n, so d has to divide n minus 1 factorial. Since uh, we have n minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod n that we are assuming that is true, so n divides n minus 1 factorial plus 1 since d divides n, so d has also need to divide n minus 1 factorial plus 1. So, now what we are going to have is d also divides n minus 1 factorial plus 1 and, but already we have that d divides n minus 1 factorial. So, d divides 1 which is a contradiction, it is because we are assuming d is strictly licensed between 1 and n. So, our assumption that n is not prime is wrong. So, n has to be prime. So, n minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod n, then n is prime. So, this is if and only if condition, that is nice condition, that is n is prime if and only if n minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod n. Wilson's theorem and its converse provides a necessary and sufficient condition for determining primality, that is an integer n greater than 1 is prime if and only if n minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod n, but this test is of more theoretical than practical interest, because as n increases n minus 1 factorial becomes very large. As we observed Wilson's theorem provides a necessary and sufficient condition for a number n to be prime, but it is very difficult to use this theorem for practical purposes it is only of theoretical importance. It is because in order to have, in order to know whether the given number n is prime or not, we have to compute n minus 1 factorial. If n becomes very large, then computing n minus 1 factorial is very difficult. It takes exponential time. Now, we will introduce linear congruences and we will prove Cheney's remainder theorem. An equation of the form a x equal to b mod n is called a linear congruence and by a solution to such an equation, we mean an integer x naught such that a x naught is congruent to b mod n. Thus, finding all integers that satisfy a x congruent to b mod n is identical with that of obtaining all solutions of linear diffontenness equation a x minus n y is equal to b. It is because a x is congruent to b mod n means that n divides a x minus b. So, with that we will get this linear diffontenne equation a x minus n y is equal to b. So, this is equivalent way of saying. If you observe here, the difference between these two is a x is congruent to b mod n, we have only one variable that is x, whereas here we have two variables x and y and also we brought n this side, that means a x minus n y is equal to b. So, here we are changing both x and y and we are looking a x minus n y is equal to b. It is convenient to treat two solutions of a x congruent to b mod n that are congruent to modulo n as being equal, even though they are not equal in usual sense. So, we will give an example. For example, 3 x equal to congruent to 9 mod 12, the solutions x equal to 3 and x equal to 9 
are considered as same as 3 is congruent to minus 9 mod 12. In general, 3 and minus 9 are equal, but here 3 is congruent to minus 9 mod 12. So, we will assume these are same solutions. In short, when we refer number of solutions of A x congruent to B mod n, we mean that number of incongruent integers that satisfy required solution. That is, x equal to 3 and x equal to minus 9 are congruent solutions to 3 x equal to 9 mod 12. Now, there is a theorem that relates linear congruences. The linear congruence A x equal to B mod n has solution if and only if D divides B, where D is the GCD of A comma n. If D divides B, then it has exactly D mutually incongruent solutions modulo n. So, it is one of important thing, GCD is playing a role. GCD is giving the number of mutually incongruent solutions to A x equal A x congruent to B mod n. As a corollary to this, if GCD of A comma n equal to 1, then the linear congruence A x is congruent to B mod n has unique solution modulo n. Now, I request here to recall in the proof of Wilson's theorem, we used A x is congruent to 1 mod p has unique solution. Now, that can be easy to see from this corollary. Thus, we observe that whenever G C D of A comma n is equal to 1, the study of linear congruence A x is congruent to B mod n reduces to finding the value of A inverse modulo n as x naught is equal to B A inverse modulo n is a solution of A x congruent to B modulo n. Now, we will go to important theorem, another important theorem in this module that is Cheney's remainder theorem. First, to look at the statement, let n 1, n 2 and so on n r be positive integers such that g c d of n i comma n j is 1 for i not equal to j. That means, they are mutually relatively prime. Then the system of linear congruences x is congruent to a 1 mod n 1 x is congruent to a 2 mod n 2 and so on x is congruent to a r mod n r has a simultaneous solution, which is unique modulo the integer m is equal to n 1 into n 2 and so on n r. Okay. Before going to prove this theorem, again we will uh, look at what are the conditions in Cheney's Ramanda theorem which we have. Here the in the hypothesis, it is required that n 1, n 2 and so on n r are positive integers, but they are, uh, they are relatively prime. That means, if n i not equal to j, then g c d of n i n j should be equal to 1. Further, a 1 and a 2 and so on a r, there is no restriction on those integers. a 1, a 2 and so on a r may be any integers we, we can consider. Then x equal to x congruent to a 1 mod n 1, x congruent to a 2 mod n 2 and so on, x congruent to a r mod n r has a solution. That means, only one x satisfying all the congruences simultaneously. So, we can call this as a solution for simultaneous linear congruences. Now, not only that one, it says, it says more that solution is unique modulo the integer m n 1, n 2 and so on n r. So, now we will prove it. So, for that we will go step by step, but proof is very simple. First we will choose capital N i is equal to m capital M by N i. We know that in the in the proof we stated m is equal to n 1, n 2 and so on n r. n 1, n 2, n r they are already given in the hypothesis. So, we n i is equal to m by n i. Then that is, uh, if you look at carefully, n 1 is equal to n 2 into n 3 in and so on n r. Here, n 1 is missing, small n 1 in the product of n 1. n 2 is equal to n 1 into n 3, n 4 and so on n r. Similarly, last capital n r is equal to n 1 into n 2 and so on n r minus 1, there n, r, n small n r is missing. So, observe that for 1 less than or equal to k less than or equal to r, g c d of n k comma 
capital N k comma small n k equal to 1. It is because in the our hypothesis n i comma n j is equal to g c d of n i comma n j equal to 1 whenever i not equal to j. So, the in the product n k we do not have small n k part. So, that is why g c d of capital n k comma small n k equal to 1. Hence, for each k there exist x k with 1 less than or equal to x k less than or equal to n k minus 1 such that n k into x k is congruent to 1 mod n k. This we this result we proved earlier as a corollary. So, now we are utilizing the now we want to prove further that is now verify that if we choose x bar is equal to small a 1 n 1 x 1 plus a 2 n 2 x 2 and so on a r capital N r x r then this is going to be the required solution. Once again if you look at x bar carefully what are these small a 1 a 2 a 3 and so on a r they are given in the hypothesis n 1 n 2 and n 2 capital N 2 capital N 3 and so on n r we computed as m by n i x 1 x 2 and so on x r just now we computed them they are they have inverse with n k that means they are n k capital N k into small x k is congruent to 1 mod n k. So, x small x k is inverse of n k under modulo n k not in general. So, that means that if you look at in modulo n k then this x k is going to be inverse of n k. So, x 1 is inverse for n 1 in modulo n 1 small x 2 is inverse for capital N 2 in mod N 2 and so on. So, now we how to prove this one again. So, before going to uniqueness just if you plug in this x bar in the equations if you do modulo n 1 what is going to happen that is if I take x bar modulo n 1 then n 2 contains capital N 2 contains n 1 portion small n 1 and capital N 3 contains small n 1 and so on capital N r contains small n 1. So, if I do modulo n 1 the a 2 n 2 x 2 is congruent to 0 mod n 1 a 3 capital N 3 x 3 is congruent to 0 mod n 1 and so on a r n r small, small x r is congruent to 0 mod n 1. So, we left with a 1 capital N 1 x 1 mod n 1, but again n 1 x 1 is congruent to 1 mod n 1. So, x bar is congruent to a 1 mod n 1. Similarly, x bar is congruent to a 2 mod n 2. So, in that way x bar is congruent to a r mod small n r. So, that is why this x bar is the required solution. So, solution is easy to see. So, the construction is very simple. Now, we will prove for we will go for uniqueness that means, uh, let x bar e x dash be another solution then we have x bar is congruent to a k mod n k for all k and x dash is congruent to a k mod n k again for all k from between 1 and r including 1 and r. Then by definition of congruence n k divides x bar minus x dash for all 1 less than or equal to k less than or equal to r, but n 1, n 2 and so on n r are relatively prime. So, m also divides x bar minus x dash. So, I request you to check this one carefully whenever g c d of n 1, n 2 and so on n r is mutually any of two g c d of them is 1 then and n k divides x bar minus x dash for all k then their product also divides x bar minus x dash. We proved this result previously for two numbers. So, uh, we request you to refer that result. Note that if x naught is a solution then x naught plus m t is also solution for all the simultaneous congruences that is for all t belongs to z. When n 1, n 2 and so on n r are pairwise co prime then the solution form of a solution form a single con congruence class modulo p namely x naught modulo m. Otherwise they are union of several congruence classes are none. So, we will illustrate with an example. So, that there is no x for which 
both x is congruent to 29 mod 52 and x is congruent to 19 mod 72 holds. This we have to show. So, in this case the simultaneous congruent solutions has no solution. It is because 52 the GCD of 52 comma 72 is not 1. So, this possibility may occur. Note that the congruence x is congruent to 29 mod 52 is equivalent to two simultaneous congruences x is congruent to 1 mod 4 and x is congruent to 3 mod 13. It is because 4 divides 52 and 13 divides 52. Similarly, the congruence x is congruent to 19 mod 72 is equivalent to 2, x is congruent to 1 mod 9 and x is congruent to 3 mod 8. Now, it is easy to check that the congruences x is congruent to 1 mod 4 and x is congruent to 3 mod 8 cannot happen simultaneously. Now, we look at another case. Here we want to solve x is congruent to 1 mod 9 and x is congruent to 1 mod 6. Clearly, x is, x is equal to 1, 19, 37 satisfy the equations. That means, uh, 1 is congruent to 1 mod 9, 1 is congruent to 1 mod 6, 19 is congruent to 1 mod 9, 19 is congruent to 1 mod 6. Similarly, 37 is congruent to 1 mod 9 and 37 is congruent to 1 mod 6. So, in this case what you have is 1 plus 54 t, 19 plus 54 t and 37 plus 54 t all for all t belongs to z, they are all solutions. So, in other words the solution set in this case is residue class 1 modulo 54, residue class 19 modulo 54, union residue class 37 modulo 54, union of three residue classes is a solutions. But in the Chinese remainder we, theorem we saw that the unique solutions, unique residue class. Why that is happening? Here again the GCD of 9 comma 6 is not 1. So, if the hypothesis of Chinese remainder theorem is not true, then for the system of congruences, linear congruences, there are two possibilities that may not have a solution at all or uniqueness may not hold. So, these examples illustrate that, that concept. Now, we will try to solve some system of linear congruences by using Chinese remainder theorem. Note that we are just showing how the proof went on in the Chinese remainder theorem. Here we are choosing that 5, 6, 7 are n small n 1, small n 2 and small n 3. It is easy to see that GCD of 5 comma 6 is 1, 6 comma 7 is 1 and 5 comma 7 is 1. So, they are relatively prime. So, as we recall m is equal to small n 1 into small n 2 into small n 3 that is uh, we will get 210 and x i is chosen so that n i x i is congruent to 1 mod n i. Now, we will fill the following table to get the required answer. This is just we are showing how we proved the Chinese remainder theorem. So, those who do not understand the proof of Chinese remainder theorem now it will be clear to them. So, if you look at in the problem what we given to us is small a 1 value is 1, small a 2 value is 2 and small a 3 value is 3, n 1, n 2, n 3 are 5, 6, 7. So, cap, capital N i that is n 1 is n 2 into n 3, capital n 2 that is n 1 into n 3, capital n 3 is n 1 into n 2. So, those values also we listed. Now, again 42 into 3 is congruent to 1 mod 5, 35 into 5 is congruent to 1 mod 6, 30 into 4 is congruent to 1 mod 7. That is why x 1 value, x 2 value, x 3 values are 3, 4, 5. Now, we will evaluate a 1 capital N 1 into x 1, then the sum is going to be 836. This is what x bar we are looking for. So, the required solution is x congruent to 836 modulo 210 or equivalently x equal to 206 is the required solution. In other words, 206 is the smallest solution for this equivalence classes. In the general solution is 206 plus 210 plus t or the solution set corresponds to unique congruence class 206 under modulo 210. Now, another example. So, here we will little bit speed up. 
So, again we will fill the same table, we request you to check the table carefully. Again A 1, A 2, A 3 values are 3, 6, 4, N 1, N 2, N 3 are 5, 6, 5, 7 and 11 and capital N 1, capital N 2, capital N 3 calculated in the similar fashion and then we will also calculate x 1, x 2, x 3, they are inverses of N 1, N 2, N 3 in modulo small n 1, n 2, n 3. So, the total sum is going to be 3513 modulo 48, congruence 48 modulo 385. Now, few comments on the proof of Cheney's remainder theorem. Let us take a fixed set of positive integers n 1, n 2 and so on n r that are relatively prime in pairs with the product is m. Note that we have chosen a i belongs to z i for 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to r. In general, a i may be any integer in the complete system of residue modulo n i for 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to r. Now, we will define a map f from z m to z n 1 cross z n 2 and so on z n r by f of x as x modulo n 1, x modulo n 2 and so on x modulo n r. Now, it is easy to see that x modulo n 1 is an element in z n 1, x modulo n 2 is an element in z n 2. So, this mapping is well defined. Then we see that f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y as x plus y modulo n i is equal to x modulo n i plus y modulo n i. So, moreover, for any r, r tuples a 1, a 2, a r which belongs to z n 1 cross z n 2 and so on cross z n r, then by Cheney's remainder theorem we can find a unique x belongs to z m such that f of x is equal to x mod n 1, x mod n 2 and so on x mod n r which is equal to a 1, a 2 and so on a r. This existence of x comes from Cheney's remainder theorem. Also, we see that the number of elements in z m and num number of elements in z n 1 cross z n 2 cross and so on z n r are the same. So, if f is a non 2 function implies that f is 1 1 as well. Thus, we have 1 1 1 to 1 correspondence between the articles a 1, a 2, a r belongs to z n 1 cross z n 2 and so on z n r and a complete residue system modulo m. Symbolically, the above argument can be expressed by writing z n 1 cross z n 2 cross and so on z n r is isomorphic to z m. Even though we not defined what is isomorphism, but those who understand, those who know previously, then this is a nice observation and nice correspondence from z n 1 cross z n 2 and so on cross z n r to z m. Now, we illustrate what we discussed till now with an example. Let us take n 1 is equal to 5, n 2 is equal to 7, then m is equal m becomes 35. Let us denote c i j is entry in the ith row and jth column of the following table. Table is given below. Uh, the table size is 5 cross 7 that is n 1 cross n 2. Then c i j we defined as this is congruent to i mod 5 and c i j is congruent to j mod 7. For example, if you take c 34 which is 18 as 8 18 is congruent to 3 mod 5 8 and 18 is congruent to 1 mod 7 as 18 is congruent to 1 4 mod 7 as well. So, by Chinese remainder theorem with this corresponds to for example, 3 comma 4 18 corresponds to tuple 3 comma 4 as shown in the following table. If you look at table carefully 1 corresponds to 1 comma 1 16 corresponds to 1 comma 2 31 corresponds to 1 comma 3 and so on, 35 corresponds to 5 comma 7 or 0 comma 0. In this module, we stated and proved Wilson's theorem and Chinese remainder theorem. Chinese remainder theorem has lot of applications in algebra. With this, we will end 
this module and also this chapter 2.